Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. And today we're going to be looking at 1917, which is the second last year of the Great War and an incredibly important one, although to be fair, they're all important years. But 1917 is really the year where this where the scales start to tip in favor of the Allies through a series of multiple events, which we'll get into through the video. If you haven't already yet, go check out the previous years, 1914 through 1916. I've already done a reaction video to those, and then that'll get you caught up to speed in case you're skipping here to 1917, because maybe you were looking up 1917 because you wanted to look at the movie, which is also a fantastic film, by the way. Um, but yeah, so 1917, hugely important year and not much to not much else to say. So let's get right into it. If you haven't already yet, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. It all helps the channel. Really appreciate your support. Let's go. In 1916, World War I became a war of attrition. Mm, yes. Both sides began to focus less on winning victory on the battlefield than grinding down the enemy and inflicting such enormous losses they would be forced to surrender. And so this kind of reminds me of actually the strategy that um, I think for me, what the first thing that comes to mind when it comes to battle of attrition is the Vietnam War, which the United States employed against uh, North Vietnam in this case. And whereas in World War One, this was a arguably successful strategy within the war of attrition, although at the loss and the cost of hundreds of thousands to millions of, of human lives, um, the strategy of attrition against Vietnam did not work at all. So I won't get into it because that's a video in and of itself, but the theory that we would just basically, we, sorry, the United States would basically just grind them down until they had no more troops left was ultimately not successful. Though in the Great War here, under these different circumstances, it was relatively su successful. In 1917, the strategy will push Europe's major powers to the brink yep. of collapse. France and Germany specifically. Germany knows it will lose a long war of attrition against the Allies, who have greater resources. So its leaders gamble. They resume unrestricted submarine warfare, believing their U-boats can cut off Britain's food imports by sea and starve the country into surrender within six months. But the new shoot-on-sight tactics mean neutral American ships will inevitably be caught in the crossfire, yep. risking America joining the war on the Allied side. Just two days into the campaign, the SS Housatonic, an American steamer carrying wheat from Galveston, Texas to England, is sunk by a U-boat. The British then pass to the US government a telegram yep. they've intercepted. And so the SS Housatonic here, right? So this is the difference between the Lusitania and the Housatonic. So the Lusitania is obviously probably the most famous one, but that was a civilian ship that had Americans on board. It was not an American ship. Uh, the Lusitania was also carrying a ton of weapons, but the SS Housatonic in this case was not, to my knowledge, carrying any weapons on it whatsoever, and it killed American civilians. And not only that, it was an American ship. Right, and that's the big difference between the Lusitania and the Housatonic. And obviously the Housatonic also is really impacting American opinion towards um, going even more against the Germans, although there's already a lot of anti-German sentiment in the United States at this point. Accepted from German Foreign Secretary Arthur Zimmermann to the hmm. German ambassador in yep. Mexico. Germany is encouraging Mexico to attack America if America and Germany end up at war. Yeah, and so they're also gearing... The Zimmerman telegram is, <laughs> again, probably one of the more famous elements of World War One. You've probably heard of it before. Um, but the Zimmerman telegram, it's also promising basically, what would you say, unlimited support and boatloads of cash, uh, which is also important for fighting a war, so that um, Germany can ultimately distract... Mexico at this point, though it's a pretty foolhardy attempt at this point. Mexico is already going through a civil war, right? The Mexican Civil War, which takes place between 1910 and 1920. And Mexico is in absolutely no position to be fighting against the United States. And so although this was pretty, you know, pie in the sky idea as it was, 
I don't think there was any realistic chance of Mexico actually, excuse me, ever joining um, against uh, with Germany and fighting a war against the United States. The so-called Zimmerman telegram puts yet more pressure on US President Wilson yep. to declare war on Germany. Yeah, and as there's a lot of anti-German sentiments at this time, there's also a lot of anti-Mexican sentiments as well um, within the United States. So this just increases the fire um, and really pushes public support for entering the Great War. Although at this point, America was incredibly isolationist. I've done a whole video series on this one, so go check those out. In Russia, enormous casualties and bread shortages lead to riots and revolution. The Tsar abdicates. A provisional government takes charge, pledging to continue the war. But at the front, Russian troops begin to desert en masse. All right, it's important to note that that provisional government, that was the Mensheviks and not the Bolsheviks, which would later come to take power under Lenin. Like I said, I did a whole video series on this, the Russia Country series, where I got into the Russian Revolution. Go check that, those ones out. I'll leave a thing in the top right here. After a string of German provocations, the US finally declares war on Germany. Yep. It brings immense resources to the Allied cause, but they will take many months to mobilize. Yeah, a very, and the German gamble very long of unrestricted time. submarine warfare may still pay off. April is the U-boat's most successful month of the war. They sink 886,000 tons of Allied shipping, an average of 17 ships a day, Crazy. all packed with urgently needed food and supplies. Wow. Britain will face starvation tons. if the U-boats are not defeated soon. On the Western Front, the British launch the Battle of Arras, a diversion to support a major upcoming French offensive. After heavy fighting, Canadian troops seize hmm. the high ground of Vimy Ridge. Now is my time to talk about Vimy Ridge. I've been waiting for this. Um, so I think Vimy Ridge is going to be a video in and of itself one of these days when I get more into Canadian history. But to make a very long story short, uh, this is tasked by Sir Julian Bing, who would go on to become one of the uh, governor generals of Canada. And it was a massive operation that... Um, had many months of training going into it. They were originally training back in Canada where they made, excuse me, models of what the German trench lines were. And it was innovative in the fact that there was the creeping barrage, which was done, which what a creeping barrage is when you fire artillery to provide cover. So you would have your men in the rear, you would fire artillery shells here, and then they would creep up and then you would be firing artillery shells like that, obviously not at your men. So the idea is, is that the Germans are whomever your enemy is staying in the trenches while your men are advancing on no man's land. As well as that, they're actually tunneling and creating massive tunnel networks um, underneath the positions here and placing mines there to blow up and uh, basically compromise the, p the position of the Germans. Um, they're also doing trench raids at this point and there's an air warfare as well. There's air operations and reconnaissance. And so this is a massive undertaking. And for Canada, why it's so important is because this was the first time that all four um, Canadian expeditionary forces fought together in a single battle. And so although Vimy Ridge, in, in terms of a tactical perspective from the war, it wasn't really that important. This was not something that broke the Western Front. They mostly just captured the ridge and then were not able to move much further than that. Um, and the Germans, I mean, I think German historians sort of write it off as a side note as, yeah, okay, it might have been a loss, maybe even a draw. Um, but in, for Canadian history, it's one of the most important events because it's seen as a unifying um, it's seen as a unifying act for our country and the Vimy Ridge Memorial, which I visited about 10 years ago, actually exactly 10 years ago, um, is, 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 is something that's still held very dearly in the hearts of Canadians and, and pretty much every Canadian is taught about it in their history class. And with Canada eventually moving forward through the 1920s and being able to decide its own foreign policy, um, World War I and Vimy Ridge overall is one of those really important events that sort of brings us to not to independence in the same way that the United States, you know, fought a revolutionary war for independence, 
but you know, uh, what would you say, separation from Britain and autonomy, autonomy over its own, um, over its own affairs. So there you go. I was, I was waiting like three videos for that one. <laughs> It's a limited Allied victory, yeah, exactly. but costs 150,000 Allied casualties to 130,000 German. Yep. Above the trenches, the first air war has reached new levels of sophistication and mm. deadliness. The Red Baron. Reconnaissance aircraft are crucial for spotting enemy positions and directing artillery fire onto them. Scout aircraft or fighters try to shoot them down before they can execute their mission. New models of- Isn't it cool just to see that we have footage of World War I? We have actual video footage of it. Uh, I know during the Franco-Prussian War, there was a photograph taken of combat there, but video footage from over 100 years ago, I don't know, I always find that cool. ...of aircraft are developed every few months. But that spring, the superiority of German aircraft leads to heavy Allied losses. Yep in what becomes known as Bloody April. Yeah, the British are being shot down around four to one uh, during Bloody April. Three days after the fall of Vimy Ridge, French General Robert Nivelle launches his main offensive. Hmm. Disaster. Expectations are high, but after initial success, the advance bogs down and casualties quickly mount on both sides. The apparently senseless losses cause morale in the French army to collapse. Whole units mutiny, refusing to attack. General Nivelle is sacked as French commander-in-chief and replaced by General Pétain, hero of Verdun, who promises no more suicidal attacks. Yeah. And so a lot of the reason for this too is because the theory goes at this point um, is that if we just dig in, we being the French, if we just dig in and wait, the Americans will show up, right? It's important to note that Americans don't start showing up until 1918, although it is important to note that there are Americans fighting um, for the Allies at this point, volunteers and whatnot. I think there was, I think there was actually a whole maybe company or, or regiment that was in the UK um, that was in the Air Force. But anyways, um, yeah, so the, the idea here is to dig in defensively and wait. And that is exactly what Germany, um, what is not going to benefit Germany, because Germany is fighting against time. Once Russia's knocked out, uh, they realize that they're not going to be able to survive the blockades that are having a massive effect on them, and they're eventually going to collapse. And so the French idea here of digging in and waiting is really a winning strategy for the Allies. That summer, at Messines Ridge, the British tunnel under the German lines yeah. and detonate 19 enormous mines the under the enemy position. Largest explosion in human history. It's the largest man-made explosion in history to date and paves the way to a brilliant, but highly local British victory. I mean, look at that crater, man. <laughs> Jeez. In Greece, King Constantine, who has favoured neutrality, is forced to abdicate, yep. and Greece joins the Allies. And King Constantine, it's important to note that, uh, like a lot of the royals at this time, he, I think his, his, it's either his stepsister or something along his line. There is a familial tie to the German royal family, and so he's really been... Although his country is, how would I put it, in a rather unstable position when it comes to which side to join the war. Um, he's eventually abdicates, uh, the civilian government takes over and they join the Allies. Russia's provisional government orders a new attack, but the July offensive is a disaster. The morale and discipline of the Russian army has collapsed. It can no longer be relied on to fight, and the Central Power's counterattack is almost unopposed. No. At sea, the Allies begin to group their merchant ships into convoys, which sail oh. under naval escort. 
Cool. The new system leads to a steady fall in losses. The tide is turning in the U-boat war. As discontent with the war grows in Germany, the German parliament, the Reichstag, passes a peace resolution, calling for a peace of understanding and reconciliation. Yep. It's ignored by the German high command, which now effectively rules the country as a military dictatorship. Yeah, and so the stab in the back theory, um, which would the which would be very very prevalent for World War II as well as post World War One, it was sort of this conspiracy theory that um, left wing entities, you know, sort of the, the the November criminals that they would become to call in 1918, um, really betrays Germany and stabs them in the back, you know, stabs the troops in the back, and this, I suppose you could call it a conspiracy theory, really. This is sort of the beginnings of this, right? So the peace resolution is adopted by the German parliament here. It is uh, supported by all the left-wing parties. So at this point, the SPD, um, Das Centrum, and the, the, I believe it's the Catholic party. And it's uh, opposed by the conservatives, right? So the, the right-wing parties are opposing this. The left-wing parties are trying to push this forward. They're trying to end the war. And this, what would you say, the, 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 the backlash that eventually the left-wing parties would get in Germany provided with this stab in the back theory as well as the anti-Semitism that was, you know, uh, attached to the this theory as well, um, would bring Germany down the path it would eventually go into Nazism. In Belgium, the British launched their major offensive of 1917, the Third Battle of Ypres. Passchendaele. It will be remembered as Passchendaele. Mud. Just mud. Heavy shelling. Rain and broken irrigation channels turned the battlefield into a sea of mud. Yep. In these impossible conditions, all hopes of a breakthrough soon fade. And there was so much mud that men and horses were lit literally drowning in mud. I mean, uh, one can only imagine what that would look and sound and feel like to have your own life ended by drowning in mud. If The attack is called off after three months, by which point the British have suffered 240,000 casualties. The Germans, 200,000. Yep. It was also important for Canada too. There's a lot of Canadians that fought there as well. On the Italian front, at the 11th Battle of the Isonzo, Italian and Austro-Hungarian forces batter each other into exhaustion. There are 150,000 Italian casualties, 100,000 Austro-Hungarian. Half a million men have died on this river. That year, 1917, the list of Allied nations grows. Brazil, yep. Liberia, China and Siam all declare war on Germany as a result of German U-boat attacks, or to curry favour with the Allies. China will contribute many thousands of labourers working for the Allies in Europe, hmm. the Middle East and Asia. Yep. Just another way to tip in the scales in favour of the Allies. That year in the Middle East, British forces avenge their 1916 humiliation at Kut by defeating the Ottoman Turks and marching on to occupy Baghdad. British forces in Egypt advance across the Sinai Desert, but are thrown back by Ottoman forces at the first and second battles of Gaza. In July, Arab rebels capture the strategic Ottoman port of Aqaba. They are accompanied by a British military advisor, Captain T. E. Lawrence. Yeah, yes, Lawrence of Arabia. Known as Lawrence of Arabia. That autumn, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour issues <laughs> the Balfour Declaration, expressing support for the creation of a national home for the Jews in Palestine. So a lot of times in history and a lot of times when I'm doing these videos, you know, the cool thing is that when you see this event, you go, oh, okay, I can see how there's some ties 
to what is happening modernly or how this was influenced and why the way some things are. The Balfour Declaration um, is, <laughs> this is an event in history that is still affecting us to this day. And it's just very clear. Every single person who lives in Israel, every single person who lives in Palestine is affected by this declaration, right? The most, arguably the most intractable conflict in human history is because of this declaration, right? And although, again, there's a whole video in and of itself, I'm not going to go into super amounts of detail because I don't, I don't unfortunately know about it. But if there's anything out of this war that you could say, yes, this is the thing that is still clearly every day affecting us, arguably it could be the Balfour Declaration. The aim is to rally Jewish support for the Allies. I mean, I think like 50% of all UN resolutions have been about Israel and Palestine. So, <laughs> you know, that just goes to show. But the declaration contradicts existing pledges to yep. Arab leaders. Yep. As well as Sykes-Picot that's also lied to them. In October, the British finally win at Gaza, clearing the way for an advance into Palestine. Six weeks later, General Allenby leads British troops into Jerusalem, ending 400 years That's of Ottoman rule. Huge. And this is where Falkenheim, as I spoke about in the last episode, excuse me, he's requested not to shell um, the old city of Jerusalem, saving these artifacts and this point of human history. With Russian forces in disarray, Germany is able to move troops from the east to the Italian front. At the Battle of Caporetto, they help to smash through the Italian army, advancing 70 miles and taking a quarter of a million prisoners. British and French divisions, desperately needed on the Western Front, have to be redeployed to shore up the line. In Russia, a second revolution brings Lenin's Bolshevik party to power. Yep. He is Again, determined to end video Russia's on that. involvement Go in check the it war. Out. In France, Georges Clemenceau becomes prime minister. Nicknamed the Tiger, he promises total war and total victory. But for the Allies in late 1917, final victory looks uncertain. Russia has stopped fighting. French armies are recovering from mutiny. The Italian front has almost collapsed. And American reinforcements still seem a long way off. For I suppose it's kind of important to know actually why it would take so long. So even though the United States has declared war, they have to call up all the men. They need to do the training. They need to do the logistics. Right? And it just takes a very, very long time to actually stand up an army. right? And that's why in the beginning of this series in 1914, um, Ru sorry, Germany had thought that it would take Russia much longer to mobilize. They, they had assumed that it would take them six to nine months to mobilize, although it actually took them much, much shorter. Um, and so that's what the Eastern Front was obviously established. But generally, it takes a nation at this point around six to nine months to fully mobilize their army um, and get them into a fighting position where then, you know, they can be effective on the battlefield. For the time being, the British are the only effective allied force in the field. Yep. Yep. So the British attack at Cambrai with the first major tank assault in history. On the first day, nearly 400 tanks spearhead an advance of several miles through German defenses. Crazy. But then the tanks break down or are knocked out. The Germans rush in reinforcements and the gains are lost. Finland declares independence from Russia. Yes. So it's Finnish Independence Day is the day after my birthday. But uh, yeah, so Finland declares independence from 
Russia, although it would not be very long until Russia actually goes through its own civil, uh, sorry, Russia, Finland goes through its own civil war of the whites versus the reds. Um, and the reds are more prevalent in the urban centers. They have a large um, holding in Helsinki, but eventually they're defeated by the whites, which are the sort of monarchist, uh, liberal, conservative branch, um, which is led by Mannheim, who would go, this would really make him famous. And then in the Second World War as well, when he was the chief of the armed forces and kind of the, the leader of the nation, although not in the same way that, for example, Ludendorff and Hindenburg here, where they have a military dictatorship. But Mannheim is incredibly influential um, in Finland and in Finnish politics at this point. And I think he's quite revered, revered, sorry, in Finland to this day. There's a massive statue of him just outside of the uh, central railway station that I that I went and saw when I was there. So, yeah, it's quite an interesting character. Romania, isolated by the Russian collapse, signs an armistice with the Central Powers. Yep. Six days later, Russia also signs an armistice. The Losing. Allied Eastern Front is no more. And Russia would go to lose a ton of territory <laughs> after this, and maybe they'll get into that later, so I'll leave it be. 1917 has seen one major Allied power Russia knocked out of the war. But the arrival of a fresh new ally, America. Germany knows only military victory can now save it from being overwhelmed by Allied resources. And they're right. And begins really? planning one last massive onslaught for the spring of 1918. Ah, yes. Spring offensive. Fantastic. Well, that's that. So as you can see, the, the, uh, the scales are tipped in the Allies' favor, and 1918 is when Germany completely collapses. And hopefully they'll get into a little bit more of the after effects as well um, of, of, of the German defeat and what that means for the country overall. So thank you very much for joining me so far. Hope you're enjoying it. I appreciate all your support. Take care, all the best, and I will see you guys in the next video. Ciao, ciao.